Good morning, good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to this, the uh, 10th edition of Life Lessons here at Asia Art Archive. I'm John Tain, head of research at AAA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation with our distinguished guests, Simon Leong and Valerie Portfei of Map Ocean, uh, formerly Map Office. Begun as part of a learning and participation program marking AA's 20th anniversary and supported by the SH Ho Foundation Limited and CK and K Ho Foundations. Uh, Life Lessons is a series that inquires into modes for education led by artists. Uh, we ask, what was the most influential lessons they had learned in school and how have they in turn passed on what they learned about forms of knowledge and care to their students or communities of learners? Today's guests, uh, Simon and Val, uh, are, we have invited because they are both prominent uh, uh, practitioners of what we could think of as post-studio or project-based practice. And we thought it would be interesting to invite them as part of Life Lessons to think about the questions of uh, related to learning and teaching in a way that intersects with their own uh, research and knowledge-based practices. Uh, allow me to introduce each of them in turn and then we will begin the conversation. So Simon Leung is an artist who lives in Brooklyn and Los Angeles. His projects include The Side of the Mountain, an ongoing opera set in Los Angeles, a decade-long co collaboration with the late Warren Yuskulowski, Art Workers Theater, Actions, which took place at uh, Kitchen in 2013, and Actions Adjuncts, which took place at, Hammer, uh, at the Hammer Museum in 2016, and extended enactments of and meditations on the squatting body, often in relation to Hong Kong, his birthplace. Leung has exhibited widely, including at the Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the Generali Foundation, 1A Space here in Hong Kong, NGBK, and Sala Mendoza, as well as biennial exhibitions such as the Guangzhou, Venice Biennale, and most recently Guangzhou, uh, co-curated by Yuan Kun. In 2008, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship and he is professor, new genres area head, and co-chair of the MFA program at the University of California, Irvine, Department of Studio Art. With Zoya Kokur, he is editor of Theory and Contemporary Art since 1985. Valerie Portfei is with uh, Lauren Gutierrez, the co-founder of Map Office, uh, now Map Ocean, a multidisciplinary platform established in Hong Kong in 1996. Portfi re received a BA in Fine Art and a Master of Architecture and, doctor and a Doctorate uh, in Urbanism, and currently teaches at the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Hong Kong. Map Office was founded and has been based in Hong Kong and uses multiple methods, including drawing, photo uh, photography, video, writing, and performance as part of the practice. Among their many exhibitions, they represented Hong Kong at the 2007 Venice Biennale and have exhibited at the Rockband Art Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the Sydney, uh, Istanbul, and Thailand Biennials, and Parasite here in Hong Kong. They won the Sovereign Art Prize in 2013, and their many publications include Map Office, where the map is a territory, The Parrot's Tale, Gutierrez and Port Fai, and Mapping Hong Kong. In 2021, Map Office transformed into Map Ocean and is in the process of relocating to Ishigaki, Japan. So welcome, uh, Simon and Valerie, uh, to today's uh, life lesson. I hope you're both doing well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and Simon, you're joining us from LA, and Val, you are joining us from Lama Island, uh, just south of Hong Kong Island, uh, in your new home, or your temporary home. Um, and uh, I thought, you know, it would be great to kind of start uh, today's session by having you talk a little about, you know, since this is a question, this is a kind of a series thinking about um, uh, education, I was wondering if you could, you know, share with us some thoughts about your own education, because I think, you know, um, even though, as your bio is made clear, you're very productive and, um, uh, 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 you know, very busy artists, um, you also don't, and teaching artists too, you don't follow the kind of the traditional, you know, like, uh, MFA, you know, BA MFA, like path of becoming, you know, an artist teacher. And um, I think, you know, each of you have 
taken a kind of uh, an unusual or non-conventional trajectory as you know for what we could think of as being um, artists and so it'd be great to hear a little about that experience um, perhaps we could begin with you Simon yeah um, first of all thank you for inviting me John and uh, it's always a pleasure for me to do anything with an institution in Hong Kong and to talk about uh, things related to Hong Kong. Anyway, uh, yeah, I am a professor at UC Irvine and I've, this is my 20th year. Oh, I, I finished 20 years at Irvine. Um, I myself, uh, I come from Hong Kong and I uh, lived there until I was turning 10. And then I went to public High school in California and then I studied art at UCLA and for a little bit at Columbia University um, and in 1988 I went to the Whitney program uh, which is a year-long uh, program in New York City connected to the Whitney uh, Museum um, and I would say that was basically the last form of education I had I didn't go to graduate school. But since about 1990, I've more or less been connected to one kind of educational institution or another. And I've been teaching uh, since about 1990 and at the university level, uh, either full time or more or less full time since 1996. Uh, yeah, so that's basically my educational background. And I mean, you know, when you were at UCLA and then at the Whitney, I mean, you worked with a number of uh, people who, I mean, would you say like, you know, like, I mean, I remember you talking about, you know, like for instance, working with Mike Kelly or with uh, Paul mm -hmm. McCarthy, you know, yeah. in LA and um, like, were they kind of, you know, how did they impact what you were doing or how did you think about or how you thought about, you know, uh, artistic, artistic practice? Yeah, um, well, I would also actually say that, um, you know, I was somebody who was very interested in art as a high school student. Mm -hmm. And I had actually written my ninth grade term paper on Chris Burden. Uh, <laughs> whom I didn't know was teaching at UCLA, but when I got there, I realized, oh, the guy that I wrote about is teaching at UCLA. Mm -hmm. But I, I never. What actually did you write did. about? Do you I remember? Didn't... Do you like what did you write about in the ninth grade? Like, yeah, I, I wrote about shoot, and I, you know, uh, and sort of like as a contextual type of thing, I wrote about you know, this group of artists who are making performances. Mm -hmm. uh, Tishing Share was somebody, you know, whom I didn't write about extensively, but I, you know, referenced and mm -hmm. Laurie Anderson. So the Kipper kids, you know, yeah. they were, you know, for, for what it's worth, you know, it was something that a suburban kid in California didn't really have much access to uh, directly. So it was extremely glamorous, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you know, these were people in New York and, and LA. So that's what I was interested in, I suppose, as a, you know, how old were you, 13? Mm -hmm. It looked it looked like punk rock to me, you know, at some level. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, I was a student of Mike Kelly's and Paul McCarthy at UCLA. Um, they, you know, they were very, very influential for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. I think that just the way that I never use the term performance art, you know, I think it probably comes from uh, Mike and Paul, you know, who never really, you, you know, Paul always says performance mm -hmm. uh, rather than performance art. And I think that the the way in which Los Angeles' uh, version of performance, it's almost, you know, now that I think about it, it's kind of like New York punk and LA punk, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And that, you know, the LA version was, or at least the version that I associate with Paul, especially, mm -hmm. was much less theatrical. You know, yeah. it was much more, in a sense, a type of raw thing that you do, you know, for a community of other people near you. Then, you know, there was 
there was a clear breakdown of um, performer and audience, I think, especially in Paul's work. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm still, you know, I, I'm, I'm extremely fond of him and, and I, I still feel that he's influential for me, mm. you know, mm -hmm. now at, on the other hand, you know, I, uh, also studied critical theory at UCLA Yeah, and I was a student of Donald Preziosi's mm. and, you know, several, several, uh, fellow students. Uh, who studied theory with me, like Amelia Jones and Lyle Massey, um, who else? Um, Kelly Dennis, you mm -hmm. know, they're well-known art historians now. Yeah. So I think that at UCLA, I had sort of a bifurcated education on the one hand, you know, as people like Paul McCarthy, and then on the other hand, you know, I was reading Lacan and Derrida and Foucault and, and all that. Mm -hmm. And the two kind of came together when I was at, at the Whitney program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is not, I mean, you know, which is like, it's not based in a educational institution, right? It's run by a museum. And so. Yeah. Yeah. It's run by a museum, but you know, it was at least in the eighties when I was a student there or participant, as we call it. Um, it was kind of the only thing like itself. I think that nowadays, you know, theory is very widespread. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that it was the decidedly political, you know, in terms of the education. Um, it was unapologetically theoretical. Mm -hmm. um, it took a very critical view of the art world and of Mm -hmm. uh, academia in general, yeah. and it didn't, it didn't confer a degree, Yeah, you know, so it, it, it positioned itself relative to, uh, institutions or major institutions as a type of marginal type of entity. Yeah. Also, when I, uh, when I was in the Whitney program, which was in 1988, um, it was during the height of AIDS, mm -hmm. right? So there were other institutions or other organizations that were very important in my life at that point. I would say that, for example, ACT UP in New York was very important. And I would say a good, I don't know, five or six members of my year attended ACT UP meetings pretty mm -hmm. regularly. Yeah. Um, in the year before, um, Tom Kalen, the, the filmmaker, uh, was in the Whitney program. And of course, you know, he was one of the people who was a part of Grand Fury, or maybe yeah. is a part of Grand Fury. I don't know if they ever broke up. Yeah. So that was the context in which I found myself, um, in terms of education intellectually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um, and, um, Val, it, like I wanted, uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little about your own trajectory because like, you know, or uh, formation, I guess you can say in French, um, because it, it seems to me that, you know, what's interesting about uh, you and Map Office is that, you know, you, you're very active within, you know, the art world and you exhibit widely, but, um, you know, you started off in art at Like Simon, but then you kind of took a a turn into architecture. I was wondering if you could talk about like, you know, what was like the thinking that that was involved in as part of that? Yeah, sure. Uh, very happy to be back this morning at, uh, at AA, uh, even online. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what was it? I think the, probably the biggest commonality we have with Simon is that we grew up and were students in the same time. Mm. And I think the late 80s were very particular time. Um, um, a lot was going on. And of course there was no internet at that time or even computer. Mm -hmm. So most of the things were really happening in the streets, in the field, uh, live uh, all the time, not like now, uh, mm -hmm. where we are most of the time online. Um, so in my case, uh, it's funny because I was, I keep on thinking about my school years. Yeah. But how to say? 
I was not really interested by school. <laughs> <laughs> For me, school was maybe it was a place where politics was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of my learning has always been done in the fields or mm -hmm. the libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, I was really barely in class. Um, I was, yeah. I wouldn't say I was a bad student or good student, but yeah, I was barely there. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was really independently working by myself. Uh, but yeah, I started to study art. Um, and because I didn't know which to choose, I both registered in Beaux-Arts and Saint-Étienne and, and, and fine art at university, mm -hmm. uh, thinking that after a few years, I would drop one to continue in the other, but I found them both so boring that <laughs> I went into architecture, which was more open as discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, I think art at that time was really about teaching new skills, not knowledge. And... Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I was really lucky because at that time they were building up the, the second Museum of Contemporary Art in Saint-Étienne after Pompidou. Yeah. And then our sister, yeah. Quit is Pompidou, uh, work to, to work on this museum. And my friend, Didier Guichard, was, uh, I think, France's biggest collector and the architect of the museum, mm -hmm. uh, uh, was inviting me basically every weekend in this multi, I mean, 38 house, house in the countryside, full of land art, Arte Povera, with artists every weekend. And it was really where I was learning. And uh, sometimes using my skills of cutting cardboard to make model for, in, for the museum to send to Richard Serra to show where foundation could happen and things like this. But um, yeah, I really learned in the field, going to exhibition meeting with artists, uh, and mainly also observing all the processes, because I don't think I was really vocal at that time. I was really the silent observer of the big change of things that was happening in my own town, revolving around the museum. And then architecture, somehow similar things replicated. Uh, when I moved to Paris to, to study at Belleville, I very quickly found myself working either in the archive of Pompidou Center or in the archive of the Corbusier Foundation. Uh, which were really my base. I've always been more interested somehow in processes, archiving, categorization, sorting material, opening boxes, uh, reading notes and, and navigating them rather than sitting in class. I mean, that's, that's, that's really interesting to hear, like, you know, in some ways the world was your classroom. And I think like, you know, um, I think you make a really interesting point about, you know, growing up at a moment when we don't have like, you know, billions of um, options or, you know, uh, pieces of information that are available just via the computer or the phone, right? Like you really had to kind of, you worked with what you had at hand in some ways. Um, so it's interesting that you you said that, you know, like you you happen to know, like, you know, um, someone in Saint-Étienne that could, you know, kind of expose you to actually a kind of a, a, a very, what sounds like a very rich range of um, experiences. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and there was also, yeah, the Hollande is from Saint-Étienne. There was a very strong group of artists uh, growing up at that time. Mm -hmm. um, there was, yeah, because of his old mining background and the territory there is really rich. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, again, if I remember my younger school years is when we were going on the coal mine to look for fossils. Mm. That's what I remember. I more, I more remember the field trips than sitting in a class. Uh, mm. And mm. yeah, I think this territory and the way to read it uh, was always of my interest. That's why in Boza we were spending the whole week to to draw the best apple when I was looking at Robert Smithson uh, <laughs> with, uh, with his trucks. So I was like, why to use a pencil where you can use a truck? And yeah, mm -hmm. I was more interested by field work. And yeah, it was Land art and Arte Povera mainly were, were a very strong force. And it's basically also the collection of the museum was really about uh, those two, uh, those two fields of, of art. So I mm -hmm. think that was probably the biggest influence um, that I had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, okay, that's really great to hear and um, really interesting. Um, I, I, and it kind of makes me think because, like, I mean, based on what I know, and we'll be we'll talk a little more about this. You know, like your own in your own teaching activity, it sounds like you're still kind of avoiding the classroom. Um, but um, <laughs> be... <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, but maybe this is like a good good place to kind of um, uh, shift from you know what you were learning as a student while you were a student to you know and not necessarily um, in the classroom per se, but um, while you were a student to what you uh, do because I think you know um, one uh, thing that I was hoping that we could discuss with uh, both you and Simon is kind of you know how do you go about as artists you know. Um, or architects, actually, in your case, Val, um, you know, when you're charged with teaching a studio class, like, what does that actually mean? Because, like, I think, you know, there's, there is the kind of tra the traditional idea that art and architecture, I think, are about the imparting of skills, of technique. And when your own practice is not rooted in that, you know, what does it mean when, like, you know, like, you know, you know, I don't know how, you know, uh, you handled this in architecture, but, you know, like Simon, like when you, you know, when you were starting out as a teacher, I imagine you were, you know, given the responsibility of teaching like foundation class or something like that. And what does that mean to, you know, like, how do you approach these kind of tasks? Um, and certainly I think in the, in your case, Val, it, it sounds like- I never like taught foundation. You've never taught <laughs> I've, I've taught high school, uh -huh. uh, but no, I, no, I, I think the people who hired me knew I had no skills. <laughs> uh -huh. Anyway, I, I, I just wanted to mention that um, uh -huh. My lack of skills was acknowledged by all from the very beginning. <laughs> okay, so so unlike Val, where Val was going to school, like you really kind of, you know, um, with your education kind of focused on knowledge. So like, you know, but you did have to, you do, did and do have to teach studio classes. So how do you approach, you know, that time with your students? Um, well, I taught uh, performance classes mm -hmm. and I taught a drawing in the expanded field class. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I should also say that, you know, part of the funny thing about art education in the, in the eighties, at, at least at UCLA, mm -hmm. was that there were people who were, you know, real painters or real sculptors, you know, Charlie Ray was, you know, the head of the sculpture department. Um, and I don't know what my problem was, but I just didn't want to have anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, my first, you know, my first year in, in college, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, I took a lot of painting classes and Martin Kersell, so, you know, who Martin Kersell and I took our first painting class together mm -hmm. and, and then we, we taught at CalArts later and, and Martin used to say to people, you know, Simon was a crackerjack painter. <laughs> so once upon a time, I didn't think it was such a, you know, uh, bad thing to, to have some skills, but, um, yeah, I, I managed to get a degree, you know, by doing things that were already, you know, in, in your term post studio. Yeah. And when I was hired, uh, at CalArts, uh, you know, CalArts doesn't really have skills-based classes. Yeah. You know, I remember I taught a seminar called, uh, The Voice, you know, which had to do with the idea of the voice. I taught a, uh, I think I taught a class called Some Voice about masculinity. I taught a class called One Small with Feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so those were the kind of seminar uh, open studio classes that I taught. And actually at Irvine, when I first got to Irvine, I taught lecture courses in front, my, you know, the, the joke, which is not actually a joke, it's merely a fact that the first time I was in a um, contemporary art history class, I was teaching it in front of 350 people mm -hmm. you know, twice a week. So, you know, I, 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 I never taught studio classes that are conventional in any way. Mm, mm, okay. 
Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, because I mean, but you do, I mean, one part of what you do is you kind of, you do lead kind of um, studio classes, like for the, for the MFA students. And one thing that, you know, um, recently you uh, did an interview for Office Hours at Art and Education. And, you know, one thing you bring up is the, you know, how you conduct crit and the idea of like uh, holding space is something that you, you discuss. And I was wondering if you could talk a little about what that means. Well, I, um, I think I said something very specific and, mm -hmm. and when I, and I know that I know that you like this term holding space, and mm -hmm. I'm sure that I said it, but I'm <laughs> not entirely sure that it it has the same value for you as it does for me. Mm -hmm. Now, when I when I talk about teaching, and you know, and the spatialization of teaching, I'm I'm not just talking about studio classes. I'm talking about any mm -hmm. form of education in a yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. And there there are two things that I that I that are important ways for me to think about it. Mm -hmm. And it took me a very long time to learn it. Mm -hmm. And the first is that I, I look at it almost as if it were a psychoanalytic proposition. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I think about the teaching experience is that, first of all, transference has already taken place. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, whoever is the teacher, whoever gets to have that position, um, I'm already imbued with this, you know, uh, cathetic experience, right? So what is my role? My role, and I, and I have to say, I actually uh, developed this idea by listening to actors, you know, so actors, they talk about, you have to, no matter how, uh, uh, and sympathetic your character is, you have to defend your character, right? You have to defend the character that I'm playing. And so I start thinking about, well, what do I, what am I doing in, in this moment of transference when, when there is projection upon me already? And I think that my role is to defend my students, but not them as entities. I'm there to defend my students' right to an education. So that's what I mean by holding space. You know, I'm, I'm, that is in a sense my medium. You know, that is the thing that I'm doing. I have to protect the space, which is for their education. And I would say that for a 350 person lecture class, as well as, you know, for a 12 person crit class. Uh, yeah, and, and when you, so when you ask me, you know, what is that, uh, what is specific about that in terms of the MFA class, you know, where there are 12 people? Um, well, I, I, I think of it as, as an experience where um, the fact that we're maybe 12 people, maybe 10 people, maybe eight people together in a room doing this, that is the real thing. So I don't think of it as a projection upon another context. I think of uh, the reality of, you know, of this small group of people talking to one another, paying attention to one another, thinking together yeah. um, as the real experience. Yeah, I think that that's that's one thing that I think is really interesting because I mean I think you know if one way of thinking about a studio class is you know about the imparting or kind of the teaching of skills or technique, it's also about kind of um, the relationship between um, the individual with you know something that they're making and something that they're doing, and there's an absorption in that activity and not necessarily with the others in the, the group, right? And it sounds like, you know, part of what you're saying is like for you, the educational process is part of that, like the diversion of attention maybe away from the kind of the object, right? To thinking about the context or the situation as itself kind of something that um, merits attention. And, you know, that, so it's like, it is a, you know, yes, holding space is like not literally like holding space, but in some ways it's kind of like a psychic kind of, you know, uh, holding space. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, I think like, uh, 
the way that the, the educational process is, you know, is both discursive, but also kind of um, psychoanalytic, I guess, in, in your way of thinking. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, kind of relates to, to your work as well. You know, I think that some of your projects uh, relate to, it calls to mind, I guess, that maybe some of the processes, you know, with, with re regard to that. Yeah, um, I, I think that, um, I think that what I strive to do, mm -hmm. and maybe it's the only way I can really do it, because I've, I, I realize that I've never actually not been a teacher, you know, as an artist, as an exhibiting artist, as somebody who's known as an artist. All the while that I've been an artist, I've also been a teacher. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's very important for me, at least, to not to uh, to to have a to have an integrated life. Yeah, you know, okay. and I try to. I try not to switch coats mm -hmm. as much as possible. I, I respect the reality of whatever situation I'm in and yeah. respect the, um, where my students are coming from. And, and you know, in my case, I teach at a public university yeah. you know, where, where most of my students, most of my undergraduate students are the first members of their family to go to college. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so, now, on the one hand, I have these students, and now the, on the other hand, I also have PhD students in complex or art history, or you know, who are, you know, in a sense, the most sophisticated thinkers yeah. possible anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel that you know what's really important is just to respect the reality of the situation. Yeah. And so teaching, being an artist, these things they don't really you know, uh, they're, they're not so separate from me. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, Val, I think that, you know, Simon was making a, a kind of point earlier about his exist his career as an artist kind of being co, uh, uh, co-existent with his uh, career as a teacher. And if I understand correctly, like basically when you, you formed, uh, you and Laurent formed Map Office shortly before arriving in Hong Kong, or no, shortly after arriving in Hong Kong, right? Just as we arrived, yeah. Yeah, and so in some ways, like your um, kind of career, your careers as map office, you know, an artistic entity, and as teachers also kind of are co uh, coexistent with one another. Has that, how has that kind of shaped uh, the work that you do and also the way that you teach? Mm, yeah. Very differently than, than, than Simon. I mean, in my case, I've always been a kind of nomadic uh, mm. academic. Um, I've been teaching in four universities in Hong Kong, sometimes in three at the same time, and in architecture, art, and design, so different disciplines. Um, and yeah, all along, um, and very quickly, actually, when we when we set up Map Office, we were both in Chinese U, Laurent was, was teaching studio and I was working mainly in the, in the library at that time, uh, doing research and, um, and we get very close to Akbar Abbas in Hong Kong, your comparative literature. And when we were in the process of building up Mapping HK uh, first publication research, actually Akbar did an exhibition, I think in 98, where he was showing the process in mm. Chinese youth. So there was a lot of permeabilities between disciplines, um, between universities. Uh, I guess it's still also the same. There's a lot of cross, uh, um, very uh, fertile exchanges. Um, and then in terms of methods, um, I was thinking some, something that's really stuck and both Laura and I, and I uh, have been stuck by this uh, chapter. Um, and this is part of our education actually in Delville. Um, but there is a very important chapter in the Corbusier's uh, Towards the New Architecture, where he's putting in parallel the Greek temple and the uh, automobile voisin. Yeah. Uh, basically putting an end of the old war against modernism, against uh, this kind of nostalgic era for the Greek time, uh, saying that they are basically the same. 
-hmm. and uh, we should just look at the processes of making uh, mm -hmm. the standardization and etc. But basically, these processes, and it goes along with what Benjamin and uh, Adibia Borg Atlas, and this is something that we um, we basically that we are teaching. Uh, always starting by building up an atlas, uh, defining, building up glossaries, and mm -hmm. then through them uh, start processes of drawing. Um, mm -hmm. But this uh, this mapping. Uh, uh, either you dig yourself now in internet, but libraries on the fields, uh, usually the free spaces, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and building up this kind of atlas yeah. um, to 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 respond questions or to argue your own uh, narrative. Uh, yeah. This is something that I think we have been developing for all these years, and uh, and we use them now even more strongly in our art practice and, mm -hmm. and in teaching in, in very similar ways. Yeah. And there is also another, uh, I think, very important group of people that met. So Mapping HK basically brought us to Venice Biennale in 2000 mm -hmm. and to present uh, Mapping HK. And this was the first kind of global architecture biennale created by Fuxas, where groups like Atelier Bauau in Japan, uh, many friends in Italy, INPS, etc., were presented for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think we were all kind of responding to a new language of architecture, still very much influenced by drawing, like in the old uh, days. Yeah. But also looking at kind of new ethnography or, 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 or maybe more informal phenomenon um, new type of economies through yeah. architecture uh, yeah. and through these globalization processes that was somehow reshaping um, the cities at that time. And this is also something very important uh, that either in the art world that we use a lot, either with my students, is the ethnographic work. And, uh, and whether you speak the language or not. For me, language has never been a barrier to, to discuss with people and to observe them and to follow them and to map their tools and, and, their, and their knowledge of the, the coastal ecologies. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, whether you speak the language or not, this is not so much important, but uh, we've been losing this ethnographic uh, research process uh, since many, many years now. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's one thing that was interesting to hear about, you know, when you were growing up and when you were a student kind of being out in the field, you, you know, as you described it and kind of the, the, in some ways, like learning in the field. And it seems like, you know, uh, one thing that you, you put into practice in your own work as a teacher is like your students are not kind of like, you know, necessarily uh, just kind of in the classroom, but actually you're, they're out doing that field work with you, right? And it seems like part of that is also um, the learning by doing, I guess, you know, um, method that I think both you and Simon, it sounds like, you know, like in some ways put, uh, implement as part of what you do as professors. But I am a little kind of struck by the centrality of drawing. I mean, when, you know, when we were talking about this beforehand, you, you, you really emphasize that drawing is kind of like the 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 basis for that research the field work that um you all do uh with your students and yourselves as well and i was wondering if you could talk a little about like you know what kind of drawing that what does that mean drawing and how does that relate to the process of you know making of mapping and um making a glossary i think for, for, I mean, drawing is the extension because you can even if you name a tree Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't draw that tree, or mm -hmm. if you don't draw the seaweed, or if you don't draw this type of shell, then it still remains a word which gives this amount of information. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, first you need to collect and recognize the tree, the shell, the, or this type of animal, then, uh, and then defining it, but then drawing it. I think by drawing, you observe, you start to... Yeah, there's one million way of drawing uh, mm -hmm. a shell or a tree or... But then once... You, so it's also a form of appropriation. Once you have drawn it somehow, mm -hmm. uh, it belongs to you because it's 
each part of this kind of recognized all the time you spend by observing something that it belongs to you and then you can reuse and bring. I love like, we have so many drawings from New Orleans that we combine with drawings made in PRD and, and yeah, I mm -hmm. love when things start to shuffle and become my own soup, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like <laughs> ingredients from different or spices from different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, mm, interesting. So, yeah. For me, drawing is this kind of form of appropriation that's when, after you start to build up mm -hmm. uh, your own image, then you can use. Mm -hmm. That's why maybe we use also this type of digital drawings. Yeah. Um, that allow us basically like a keyboard of words to write. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking about the digital, I mean, I think that, you know, one thing that has um, kind of impacted um, various forms of visual making is, you know, uh, the computer and the digital, right? I mean, I think earlier we were talking about what it was like to be growing up at a moment when that wasn't accessible. Um, but, you know, I was wondering, like, how does it, how does it actually affect, you know, um, making now that, you know, people do have access to, you know, like, I mean, I think like earlier, in an earlier maybe regime or an earlier period, people would say like, okay, well, drawing, was the kind of the basis of um, an art an, an artist's practice. You always carry a notebook with you or a sketchbook with you and you kind of make those kind of sketches. Whereas like, I feel like, you know, more recently, one thing that, you know, I hear is like, you know, basically video is kind of like that kind of note taking now where people just, you know, use their phone and like, you know, take a, take a video if they want to capture something. And um, certainly in the field of architecture, you know, like drawing has, has changed a lot. It's no longer necessarily something done with uh, analog with like a pencil on paper right it could be done something like you know digitally as you were saying and i was wondering how has that kind of uh changed the way that you approach these kind of uh this basic uh, practice i guess simon you want to be <laughs> for me <laughs> I don't know. I mean, well, when you know, <laughs> computer, I was mainly working on models and three dimensional. So I don't so see I, much drawing. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, I started to draw actually with a computer. With a computer. Yeah. Hmm. I, I actually have some thoughts about this because mm -hmm. you know, one of one of the very few studio classes I have taught has been drawing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's but it's always drawing in the expanded field. Now you know. So on the one hand, there's conventional drawing by hand, which is you know also a part of the course. But you know, I, I partly um, conceived of the class uh, in dialogue with a with an essay by Pamela Lee mm -hmm. on some kind of duration. Yeah. In which she, you know, I, I'm sure you know you know this, John. And there, it was a show uh, curated by Connie Butler at, at MoCA. And, and Pam Lee's, uh, this discussion of drawing, you know, basically goes into three fields mm -hmm. or three uh, modes, three signs. Uh, the contingent, mm -hmm. um, the transitive, and the entropic. Yeah. So, I have my students read, you know, this text, and then we talk uh, at length about what does each of these categories mean, right? So uh, the contingency of drawing, you know, meaning whatever, whatever um, surface or whatever uh, substrate that the drawing is on, yeah. that constitutes a type of contextual relationship. Um, the fact that drawing is always transitive so that, you know, if it's in relationship to, you know, a building, it would be some sort of sketch or it could be a blueprint, you know, for a choreographer, you know, a choreographer can also make drawings, which would be about movement. Um, for a painter, a, you know, a drawing would be a sort of template for something to come. So the way that I, I taught it, you know, would be according to these different modalities of drawing, which of course already incorporates 
video or your phone or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, the assignments would be make a drawing that destroys itself, make a drawing with a car, because we, you know, we're in Southern California, everybody had a car. If you don't have a car, make a drawing with your body, uh, mm -hmm. make a drawing that cannot be seen. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, these are all ways, I think, in which we think about, you know, in a, in a sense, what the, what the student may care about uh, yeah. the activity of drawing, not so much as a thing of itself, but what it might, how it might be useful for them. Yeah. You know, so a, a very precise example of that would be to really think about how, uh, for them, mm -hmm. a drawing is like a rehearsal, for example. So mm -hmm. what is the aesthetic of the rehearsal? What is the fact of grappling with a work of art or maybe a moment in life or maybe life itself that is never finished, mm -hmm. that is always, in a sense, in progress? So, you know, those are things that would come up for me in, in a drawing class. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, hmm. Wow. Val, do you have anything you'd like to add or thoughts about, you know, the... I mean, I'm, I'm totally sharing this with Simon. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love the open, non-ended uh, processes. So drawing is never finished, text mm -hmm. is never finished, things can be rewritten and um, yeah. Yeah, um, it's all about processes, and uh, it's also interesting. Again, go back to this eyes that can see is that as you continue learning, everyone every day, uh, you can see mm -hmm. every day things that you could not see the day before. And, and I really love also to recognize these processes of eyes opening as a life process, basically. Yeah. So. Everything in terms of drawing would change mm -hmm. on a daily basis, and uh, and in what we can recognize and, and, and see, yeah, or what mm -hmm. we give importance to uh, compared to ten years before. That's, mm -hmm. that's I think what yeah, what's the drawing, that's the writing uh, mm -hmm. is embedded with. Yeah, and you know, I mean, Val, you're talking. You know, you bring up the question of like, you know, the the kind of the change over or the kind of how you respond to the place, but also how you respond to kind of over time, right? And um, you're, you've been working in a place, uh, Hong Kong, that, you know, is known, notorious for kind of constantly evolving and changing. And this is something that, you know, in your own work, uh, you've really documented, you know, at that moment kind of like of uh, enormous change with the, during the 90s with globalization uh, of both, you know, Hong Kong and China uh, and the Pearl River Delta, right? Um, but then I think like, you know, one thing that I'm, I, I'm curious about is kind of like the, 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 the shift in focus from the kind of maybe the more, um, urban, uh, textures of Hong Kong to maybe it's like, you know, lesser known, um, uh, how do I describe it? Countryside or like ocean side, or, you know, kind of like the, the natural side of Hong Kong, I guess, maybe and the interaction of the human and the natural within that context. And I was wondering if you could say a little about, you know, um, you know, because like, I think your practice has really been, been in development and dialogue with this environment, the environment of Hong Kong. I was wondering if you could say a little about, you know, how your thoughts of, about that and how that's kind of been um, uh, a, a kind of a, a, a conversation, I guess, with, with this place, like your practice. Mm, that's true that it's really evolved with, uh, yeah, with the history of Hong Kong. I mean, when we arrived, it was mainly all about Hong Kong Wai mm -hmm. and the expiration date, because it was 95, and uh, Anak Barabas, the city of disappearance. So Mapping HK was redefining really six different times. Mm -hmm. uh, it's where also we rapidly found out that physical density was not so much an issue. Yeah. Um, temporal density was really important. And that's, uh, that's how maybe also in the first uh, years of parasites, it was not so much about the space, but all the performance that were happening with and around in the neighborhood. I remember Sarah Wong was doing these long walks 
across neighborhoods. And it was something that also we developed later on with Runscape uh, by defining new routes to cut through the city. Mm -hmm. uh, also in 3D and this, this idea of an accelerating time. Mm -hmm. um, so this was, yeah, the first, let's say, 15 years block. Um, and then we, we jumped into what we call the invisible, the invisible territory, the invisible islands. And, um, and yeah, and this is really rich and this is, this could go on forever because Hong Kong is so complex. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, uh, and each island in the beach or not has so much different specifics and skills and culture, but it's, yeah. uh, it's a very interesting new territory that we started to uh, to develop, and and that's why I'm quite fascinated. It's just one month. I'm here in this little house on the beach in Lama, and uh, and there's so much to learn, and I'm very happy to spend now time on one spot, uh, learning from the tides, from the type of shells, from the birds' routine, from the bamboo mm -hmm. type of growth and response, and. Uh, Again, it's maybe it's a different way of looking at uh, at the territory. Mm. Uh, but John, I was very happy because you kind of follow our move from Taiwan map office to map ocean, <laughs> <laughs> conceptually and and physically. And you could see that basically, I mean, we filled up um, a big storage, and fifty percent is collections of books, and fifty percent is collections of shells, yeah, and stones, and and bird nest and crazy things that we are planning to ship to Japan. Mm. But I think it's it was also very nice to kind of reflect uh, all those 25 years in, in, in Hong Kong or more uh, mm. and see what is left. And I think, yeah, the collection of books and the collections of uh, coastal artifacts uh, from all over the world are really representing basically mm -hmm. our, our personal construction. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I want to I want to say that Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Rosa Luxemburg thought that uh, her you know like her truest greatest pleasure is listening to birds. It's the sound of birds, and of course uh, there's this thing that's been circulating on the internet for a while about how how uh, this, the sound of birds makes people much happier than money. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot agree more. <laughs> and I would add the sound of waves. Mm. Well, there you go. <laughs> and I'm lucky because I don't, you cannot hear, but from my window, which has just opened, I have both. <laughs> Birds and waves. So you, you're the wealthiest person. <laughs> That's my new life. <laughs> yeah. No wonder you're so happy. <laughs> yeah. So John, I wonder, I wonder if now it might be a good time for us to share slides. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of, of birds and I, oceans and waves, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I think I think maybe Valerie should go first because we are on this theme. Yeah. <laughs> of of islands and waves and, and and nature. So I'm really eager to see that. I mean, we can do that. I I I. I yeah, I just, I don't know how to do this. Maybe Johnny can advise. I don't want this to transform into suddenly a personal lecture and cut the discussion. Mm. But maybe I can introduce or give visual to a few things. Very okay. Quickly. Okay. Uh, so. Yeah, because we have, uh, each of you have prepared a few images to share, but, you know, we can take a look at those. I think in your case, Val, they definitely give a sense of what we've been talking about. Okay, is it working? Yes. Yeah, so I will really go very quickly, uh, mm. just showing, because basically it's also the stretch first book, Matchke, and last one, Our Ocean Guide. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, it's interesting the way we very rapidly open up, because Mapping HK, just Laura and I, and then Our Ocean Guide had 56 
contribution from mm -hmm. various disciplines. Yeah. Uh, and this is also, yeah, the type of territory uh, for me, this is probably the space in Hong Kong I worked with the most in the Fosan, the oyster fields, uh, bringing to the parrot's tail and the stories in, in Dennis, uh, collecting stories and from fishes, the mm -hmm. platforms, following uh, divers in Japan, but not only in uh, their daily practice of diving, but also in their practices of uh, gardening, feeding the birds, uh, being this amazing, uh, this strong women working in mat matriarchal kind of uh, coastal uh, economy. Mm. Uh, in Thailand, running from the sea gypsies uh, and collecting also ghost nests uh, with the activists as part of a process of a project where trying to leave zero footprints uh, from, from a Biennale, uh, something we became more and more concerned with. So with Gung, we learned so much, so much starting from his own territory and, and probably 200 islands around Krabi and then uh, his knowledge of how to, fi how to fish and, and, uh, and build up his own environment. And, and then here we, kind of wrap up the performance by asking to leave and perform living in Ghost Island. Um, also, I would love to work on physical theory, but sometimes territories are very abstract and we spend so many years in mapping the South China Sea disputes. And, uh, and I really love the idea of islands as not as something uh, physical and tangible, but as something that grows shrink uh, are so much objects of, uh, of potential disputes from where the words can be uh, always reshuffling. And, uh, and actually the Santaku are very, very close to Ishigaki, uh, mm -hmm. the next place where we're moving and Japan just built um, a new air base uh, in Ishigaki Island that opened last year mm -hmm. uh, as the closest point since Okinawa is mainly the American army, the Japanese army is relocating there in Ishigaki. That's not the reason I'm moving there. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, after so many years of being in Hong Kong uh, and looking for maybe a live experiment from a small territory, a small island where we can really grasp all the components of the economy and the ecology. Um, uh, that's where we landed. Mm -hmm. I really love this rock for me. It's like the belly button of the world. Uh, mm. and the land we have is just next uh, to this. And so, yeah, my daughter just put this drawing that I totally forgot about uh, on her door. So that's mm -hmm. a good conclusion, looking for an island and, and, and finding your island from where to we start. Mm. Okay, great. I yeah, I... it's not too long. No, 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 no it's fine. Um, and Simon, you, I think you had prepared something that, and maybe this is also a way for talking about, because I think, you know, one question I had for you was like, you know, your uh, connection to Hong Kong as well, since you were born here, and it's, it's something you refer to in your work as well. Yeah, um, okay, so let me share my slides. So I'm, I'm showing you this image because I noticed that on the website, uh, we had a little book that I wrote mm -hmm. years and years ago. Can you see yeah. this? Yeah. And the title of the book is uh, Three Boys Pose for a Camera None of Them Are Looking Into. So I thought uh, we could have a reference. <laughs> uh, but but um and one of them is you <laughs> <laughs> which which one john <laughs> yes one of one of them is me and i just went on uh, uh the website of the elementary school it's it's wiley seal hall and it's still in north point uh -huh. uh, in uh in book uh, mm -hmm. and the and the uniform is exactly the same <laughs> as it was, you know, 50 years ago. Anyway, um, yeah, 
my my Hong Kong roots, um, but I thought that what I would do um, as per John's instruction to us was to just talk a little bit about Post Studio, um, and uh, he had asked me to talk about Trail A and uh, Dancing Trail A before, so I thought I would just share this image. Now, now the, one of the more pivotal moments in my life you know, obviously was being in the Whitney program where I met Yvonne Rayner. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to give you a sense of uh, this 30 year engagement with Yvonne Rayner, you know, resulted in learning Trio A and performing it. Um, so on the right, you see me dancing Trio A um, in Chinatown, actually in Los Angeles. And then a few years ago, there was a flag controversy at my university where uh, some undergraduates were bravely saying to the, the world that no flag of any nation should be displayed in this area that they consider to be theirs. And when the chancellor came up with, uh, came back with, oh, there will be many flags that will be flown on the UCI campus, rest assured the old glory will be all over campus, so I just thought I would restage or stage my version of uh, Trail A with Flag um, by Yvonne Rayner from 1970, just to carry out my duties as a professor at the university to put as many flags as possible on campus. Um, so that's a version of, of working, teaching, learning. And on the bottom right is a uh, is a show that I uh, did uh, with Carol Lu, Carol Yuma Lu from the Inside Out Museum in Beijing just a couple of years ago. And we did a project called Introduction to Yvonne Rainer, Beijing. Um, anyway, so that's an ex one example of the post studio. Um, perhaps another example is my. 27-year collaboration with the late Warren Sobosky. And oftentimes when I'm working with Warren, we don't have a goal in mind. You know, we are just spending time together and then eventually they turn into films or they turn into performances, so uh, installations. Uh, another example would be an opera that I co-wrote with um, Michael Webster. Um, this is 20 years ago now, uh, an opera set in Griffith Park about cruising. Um, but it's really kind of a meditation on the idea of the public and also of, of you know, what was certainly the most important event in the, uh, in the sense that perhaps Alain Badu talks about the event in my life, which was AIDS. Um, so if the, uh, this, this opera basically depicts an anonymous sexual encounter between two men at dusk in, in uh, Griffith Park in LA. Um, actions and action, actions. This is a piece that, uh, that uh, John saw, I think. Um, and it's, again, a, a many year meditation on art workers and um, I wanted to make a work that was my version of an art worker's theater, meaning the people who perform in the, in the piece were, in a sense, meditating on and enacting variations of their own material conditions as people in the art world. Um, and since 1994, I've been making squatting projects in um, different parts of the world. And this was in the Guangzhou Triennial. Uh, this was a piece that took place in Hong Kong's proposal for squatting project Hong Kong, which in a sense I'm still making because it's a work without a form. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was designed as a project that didn't take any one form. So you see there is a a squatting workshop, spontaneous, uh, unintentional collaborations with workers uh, who were cleaning the space at 1A. Um, 
then yeah, and and this is the project that I'm still continuing. So you see, this is a piece called Rehearsal for Nine Collective Movements for the Guangzhou Biennale. And so Duchamp's New Descending a Staircase, uh, the meeting of the South and North Korean uh, uh, leaders in, nine, in uh, 2018, um, some K-pop groups uh, working with Korean university students, uh, most of whom didn't speak any English. And I was thinking very much about forms of affiliation and forms of collectivity. For example, the, the text that you read here is actually a, a, a short synopsis of what happens in the Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Um, and I was thinking very much about thinking, about working with young people and what that might mean. Uh, yeah, and thinking about connections between protests in different uh, countries like 1980, Korea, uh, and 1970 in New York. The top right is Street action, which Ivan uh, Ivan Reina calls M walk, um, and of course I go back to, in a sense, my objet petit a, you know, this this image of an arrest of quote unquote leftists from the nineteen sixty seven uh, riots in Hong Kong, uh, and so this this image has retained its power for me and it's something that I'm still working on. Um, of course, uh, when I started the project 12 years ago, I was thinking, oh, let's think about the idea of the left. Let's think about protests yeah. in Hong Kong and the police. Um, so needless to say, these are relevant issues today. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that uh, that was, thank you, uh, Simon, and thank you, Val, for your presentations. I think that, you know, maybe for those uh, amongst our audience who may be less familiar with either of your practices, this helps give uh, maybe a, a better sense of things. I'm a little conscious of the time, and I uh, just wanted to leave some room for Q&A and discussions. And so maybe at this point, we can open the uh, floor to our um, audiences, wherever they may be in California or Lama or Hong Kong or Kowloon or other parts of the world. Um, and uh, let's see, do we have uh, questions from the audience? Or do you have questions for each other? Okay, while we're waiting, maybe I can ask a question to, to both of you, um, which is, I think that, you know, um, Simon, you, you were touching just now on the kind of like the, the way that Hong Kong kind of still is your, you know, you called it uh, your object, you know, and the way that it kind of uh, relates to um to your work or as part of your thought even while you're based you know very in california and and new york and i was wondering if you could say a little about like you know um how that maybe has become um something that because uh it seems to me that maybe in the last few years it's become much more um evident in your kind of in your practice in your work that your reference to uh to the place and I think like, you know, um, you know, in uh, Val and Laurel's work as map office that, you know, Hong Kong has been very evident, obviously, because it's been their kind of the, the, the site of their, their research. Um, but in your work, I was wondering if you could say, speak a little more about that, that relationship to, to this place. Yeah, well, um, I don't live in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. but uh, almost every single member of my extended family lives in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that having had grown up there, 
there, you know, there's something that I think is very special about Hong Kong, not because it is exceptional, mm -hmm. but because I think Hong Kong is a place where you're always looking forward and backward, and you're always, in a sense, anxious about its status. And this is something that I felt as, you know, very much as a child, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the psychological and emotional structure mm -hmm. that a place like Hong Kong, which uh, which understood very, very, uh, in a very embodied way, its own contingency and its own uh, temporary status in relationship to greater power. Um, it's just, you know, in, in a way, more and more resonant for me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, and I also think that I don't think about Hong Kong so much in terms of content, but in terms of context, right? So, for example, what is Hong Kong to people in China? What is Hong Kong to, you know, the people who come and go? Mm -hmm. What is Hong Kong to the people who are from there, who live there? Yeah. And so there's this continually transitive dimension, I think, to, to the place, which isn't really about the place itself, but much more about a relationship to being. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I think, especially in light of what's happened in Hong Kong in the last couple of years, yeah, and in light of uh, the limits that are placed on what is possible for people in Hong Kong, yeah, or for teachers, for politicians, whatever. Mm -hmm. I think more and more I feel the the call and the responsibility. Mm -hmm. for those of us who do not live in Hong Kong to, in a sense, um, keep thinking about it and keep making work about it and, and uh, to, in, you know, in a, in a way, to keep the fidelity to yeah. our desires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it's interesting, I think, you know, that... Um, the the relationship between Hong Kong as a place and uh, and the people who kind of have connections to Hong Kong because there's so because it's not just the people who live here it's also there's a large community of people who are diasporic Hong Kongers right um, and um, it was one of the the kind of the the kind of maybe gambits of uh, bringing both you uh, Simon and Val together was like thinking about you know like Hong Kong from a diaspora position Simon as someone who is from here but not here, Val as someone who has been here but is not from here and is soon going to be diasporic from here as well, right? Um, and um, do you have, uh, like, I don't know if you want to, like you were saying earlier what that shift, you know, kind of like the, the kind of imminent shift Val for you from, of, of leaving here and then moving somewhere else. But I was wondering if you have, you, you've been thinking about that kind of, that relationship to this place and, and how that kind of um, uh, maybe your your relationship to that? Mm. Yeah, I mean, of course. Um, uh, I mean, Hong Kong is home, mm -hmm. and also where children are born, and so I was not grown up here, but then uh, growing up kids here mm -hmm. is also a very interesting process. Um, yeah. What, what I really like with the idea of going to Japan first is that um, uh, it's not far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when airplanes were connecting Hong Kong to Ishigaki, it was basically 80 minutes flight, so nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and also there is a lot of commonalities uh, that I observe in the, in the territory. In, mm -hmm in the shell, in the stones, even if we are very different type of corals and, and sea here, there, there, is, there are so many communities already that I started to, to establish as link. Yeah. Uh, also Ishigaki is 
is in Japan, but it's not really Japan. Um, I call it the island of the misfits because it has a fascinating history of pandemic uh, ravage, uh, really sometime uh, in the Yayamas, uh, killing 80% mm -hmm. of the populations. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of uh, slavery story, like my fisherman's friend's father arrived as slave uh, in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's so much uh, shift and resilience in, in those Yayama Islands that uh, you barely, I mean, basically no one is really a local. And what I really love when I go there is that people don't ask you, where are you from? Mm -hmm. They ask you, why are you here for? And mm -hmm. what, are, what are you planning to do with the islands, with us? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is a very interesting question. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, most of the people, most of the community around uh, the area where I will be based are there for less than 10 years. Um, mm. And, uh, but I know what they are doing for the islands. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of fit interlock as a jigsaw together to develop something good. Uh, for the yeah. island and for the community. That's why, that's why I'm very interested in, in this shift. Yeah. But this is also something I learned from Hong Kong because it's what small communities, island communities are doing here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's- yeah, I was gonna say, it sounds very familiar, the idea of like, you know, like having a small community and coming together and, and building something, even if you're not from here, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because it's also a way of weaving the territory, whether mm. whether they are indigo makers, pottery makers getting the, the elements from the local soil or growing special herbs or fishing. Yeah, there is this kind of connection. Each is nourished by a certain aspect of the territory. Uh, and I think the territory basically is weaving the community. And that's how in Hong Kong, we can also find very big resilience from local community. I'm working, for example, in Chimawan in Lanta with my students, and we can find this resilience and these uh, ways of doing, uh, which is quite fascinating uh, and very different from the next bay and very different from the bay after this one. So there's also something very unique, but in the way the knowledge of old people uh, helps to weave this community and this territory together, I think is really important. And it's probably what Hong Kong was teaching me in the last years. Yeah, I mean, I think this question of fidelity, um, as Simon was pointing out, and resilience is, are, are things that one definitely sees a great deal of here and maybe um, you know, not just something that, uh, you know, since, you know, this is uh, nominally a series about teaching and learning, it's not something, it's something that, you know, we learn from Hong Kong, right, like these qualities, um, and um, it's great to hear both of you from your perspectives talk about that relationship as well, um, not just, you know, the information and the knowledge that you've shared, but also the knowledge that you've received, um, and it's been fantastic having you. And, you know, I, when I invited both of you, I didn't realize that you had met before. I think it was in 2010, right, in Shanghai at a conference. So I'm glad to have been able to bring you both together for, for a conversation now, 12 years later, or 11 years later. Um, and um, thank you both so much for joining us. Um, Simon from LA, Valerie from Lama, um, and, um, Thank you to our audiences for joining us uh, today as well. Um, and if um, there, are, do either of you have any last comments? If not, um, I'll just say thank you to our audience for audiences for joining us today, and to stay tuned for the next and final edition of Life Lessons, which will be coming up soon. Uh, and thank you both so much, and thank you all. Thank you, uh, John, Simon, Osge, and the A team, always doing very important, meaningful, ongoing uh, work. Thanks a lot. Good luck with the move. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the question and, is when. <laughs> yes. 
And uh, everybody at Asia Art Archive, I'll see you in Hong Kong. See you in Hong Kong. This year in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ciao. Bye. Bye. Thank you.